Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. All right, so are we ready to uh, receive something? Um, that was overwhelming. Thank you, the one person. <clears throat> I want to talk to you tonight about the reclaiming of sacred space. I uh, just want to say as well, welcome to everybody watching us on, uh, on live stream and those of you who listen to this on podcast and those of you who watch the, the video just to see my pretty face later on rather than just listening to the words. I um, appreciate um, that many of you who watch us on that are in ministry. For those of you who are not and you say this is your church, as I said last week, the little word at the bottom doesn't say donut. Okay, it says donate. We want to serve you. We'd like to be a blessing to you. If you'd like to help us, that would be wonderful. But there you go. Okay. Um, I was also very humbled um, yesterday having a conversation with Biju Thampi, who is... Uh, you know, Martin and Bina, Bina's brother, um, of course, we've ministered extensively with those guys in, uh, in India. Very humbled at our um, growing influence to affect other people. What, what is sometimes disappointing to me, but on the other hand, very humbling, is that we are getting to the place where we are having a bigger influence beyond our little group than we are within our little group. And uh, I would like to balance that up here because I think there's some very, very important things in the context of people's lifestyle that uh, we want to impart. So, there is um, a story in the Old Testament back in the book of Genesis that relates to a, a, a guy by the name of Jacob who, if you're familiar with any of the names back then, Jacob was the grandson of Abraham, the patriarch, and um, this little story is an interesting story because it picks up an, uh, uh, at a place in Jacob's life where he's cut out on his own, um, but some things have been okay, but not everything figured out the way that he thought it would when he first cut out on his own. And this kind of picks up the story where what he got himself involved in, he's trying to move on from there, and many of the pressures of where he is now are making him need to move on, and this picks up the story of what's happening. Now, now in this story, it's kind of rich with, um, with allegory, with, with picture, with symbolism, that some of what I want to convey to you before we go on to talk about some of the finer points that are here. So in Genesis 28, uh, chapter 28 and verse 10, it says, Jacob left Beersheba, which is where he'd gone to try and work out his stuff. And uh, now he has to move on, which most of us do in life. It says, and he set out for Haran. Now, uh, at, a, at a surface read, that will not mean much to many of you. But Haran was a place where his grandfather had stopped for quite a long period of time during his own grandfather's journey through life and having to go somewhere where he knew he need, needed to get and leave something he knew he needed to leave. And uh, Haran, unfortunately, was the place where you get stuck in the middle, okay? So for all of us, when we're trying to negotiate our way through life, very often in the move from where we were to where we need to be, we get stuck somewhere in the middle. Haran was the middle place. The sad thing is that some of you will die in Haran. Some of you will never make it out of Haran because you had to get away from what was, but you're afraid of what will be, so you get stuck. Some of you will die in a religious Haran. You'll die in a place where you got stuck between what you knew and what you need to know, but you're afraid to move on. So this place is rich with symbolism. I would define it as this. For all of you here today, Haran is where you live without the problem of where you were or the challenges of where you're going. Let me say that again. Haran 
is where you live without the problem of where you were and the challenges of where you're going. It's a place you get stuck. So the story goes on to say that in, in Jacob trying to make this journey into what should be his future, into what should be a good place, it says he reached a certain place. I love that terminology, a certain place. Really, the Bible's telling you this could be anywhere. It's just, it's a place, but it's a certain place. Now, I didn't say it was the place of certainty, because there is a difference between the place of certainty and a certain place. You're not often got certainty in the certain place. It's where something of the real you, something of your real issues, begin to find an expression and a solution. So he arrives at this certain place. Now, now this could be the certain place tonight. The pew that you're sat in, the seat that you're sat in, could be your certain place tonight. Because he's actually out in the middle of nowhere. He'd stopped for the night because the sun had set. That's a good reason to stop for the night. But again, in what I said about the rich symbolism here, um, in our life there are times when the sun goes down on the day that we're living in. And um, that's when we can tend to get confused in the darkness and when we wonder whether we can find a way out because the sun's gone down on our day. Okay? And you've been there, I've been there. Those, those are dark days when the sun went down. You, the, the sun once shone on where you were, but now the sun's gone down and you're in this place. So he's in this certain place and the sun's gone down. And he does something real weird, I think. I mean, for me it's weird. It's like, flip, why would you do that? Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. Like, it's not the brightest thing in the world, is it? You know, why would you put your head on a stone to go to sleep? Now, of course, you could say, well, maybe you wanted to be cool. But it's cold in the desert at night, so that's a dumb answer, okay? Um, I, I think there's actually a picture being painted here that, that when he got down to sleep, he was actually in a place of discomfort. When you try to sleep with your head on a stone, don't anybody tell me that that's going to be comfortable. It's a place of discomfort. But you see, there's a point to be made here that very often we find the sacred place in the place of discomfort. Where in our own lives we are going through discomfort. Now, this is so powerful that a whole generation of Christians tried to recreate this. You see, the monastic life was about creating discomfort. Because they thought that in the place of discomfort, if we create it, we'll find the sacred place. And some of them, with the right attitude, probably did. Much as I have no intention or desire to take up the monastic life or become a monk with all that stuff. I, I don't like sandals anyway. So that would, the sandals would do me and be like, no, it's all right. Um, but can you see how... how even in the church, we try to create a scenario that when it happens organically, is actually a really good place to reclaim the sacred space that God wants to put you in. So, so our discomfort, the place of discomfort and in the darkness, is often the place that you can really discover this sacred space. So he puts his head and lays down, okay? Um, and he has a dream, and in the dream he sees this stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And what he says next is really significant because it says the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. So here's the picture, we've got a stairway going to heaven. Now, now you probably want to sing some kind of a song on that. Every time I read that, it's like there's a song in there that needs to be sung. But, but rather than sing it... Um, in the symbolism of this, there is something very powerful because if he saw angels, spiritual beings, ascending and descending, where were the angels to start with? See, if it said descending and ascending, then the solution would be coming out of heaven into the earth. But once he says they were ascending and descending, he said something was happening here that was touching there to come back to here, okay? So there's a tremendous 
um, value that was being placed on our own humanity, our own existence here on earth, our own life, and the care was not, I'm up here looking down on you. It's if you find this sacred space, you will realize that something is already going up from you to heaven, and something is coming back to you from heaven. So he sees this in his, his dream, and and he says that at top of this stairway, what he saw was, was the Lord. And he said, and, 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 and the Lord, God, the Lord, who he saw, whether you think it was a manifestation of Jesus or whatever, he said, I am the Lord, listen to this, the God of your father Abraham. Now that's interesting because Abraham wasn't his father. Abraham was his grandfather. But the Lord said, I'm the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. So Isaac was his father, Abraham was his grandfather, but the Lord says, I'm the God of your father Abraham. So here's the great importance in that. Abraham was not his biological father, but God was saying to Jacob, it's not your natural father who has the solution to this issue. It's the father beyond your natural father. We all have a father, beyond our natural father. And your natural father might have been a dog of a person. I mean, he may have ruined your life, but God's message is always you have a father beyond your natural father. However you were affected, however you were raised, even if your father was good, the message was you have a father beyond your father. You see, I do not believe that people have to jump through hoops say a certain kind of a prayer um, or live a certain kind of a lifestyle for God to declare himself as Father. I think the whole of Jesus' ministry was pointing us back that God was a Father. And the whole story of the New Testament, I believe, is encapsulated in this wonderful story called the prodigal son, which I've told you before is not about prodigal son, it's about a wonderful father. And it's how the father waits for the son. The son never ceases to be a son of the father. And the father never ceases to be the father of the son. He's waiting for the moment where there is a sacred space. And in that sacred space where there is discomfort and sometimes darkness. And where we've got stuck between where we were and where we need to be. And in all our struggles, some, somehow we meet the father of creation. That's called a sacred space. And so here in the desert, in just this certain place, which could be your certain place, right here, right now, he's going through this experience. And he says, I'll give you and your descendants the land on which you're lying. And then let me run the story on. I will not leave you until I've done what I've promised to you. I believe the Father still says that to you. He said in verse 16, when Jacob woke from his sleep, he thought... Surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Now, um, he, was, he, was, he was excited and confused at the same time. Uh, he was excited at the experience that he had had because he had had a very deeply impacting spiritual encounter which was to totally change his life. But the other problem was that he thought it was related to that specific space. So he put a pillar there, not a pillow, a pillar from the stone that he laid his head on out of his discomfort and called it Bethel, the house of God, because he thought somehow here in this desert, this was where the little doorway to heaven was. So kind of if you could find your way back there, just maybe you could find the same door. Now, of course, where he was mistaken was that, that the experience that he had was not place-related, it was actually heart-related, and that because of what was happening in his heart, he had found a place where heaven was just that far away. Now, the Celtic Christians used to call those thin places. So they built all their monasteries in thin places, 
which meant that they felt somehow there, somebody at some moment had had a Jacob-type experience where they had reclaimed a sacred space and so they built the church because they felt that heaven was that close. Now, I don't care what our background of belief is, from atheist to Buddhist to whatever, all of us in life are looking for a thin place, a place that we can touch something that is incredibly beyond the natural world, but imparts its power into the natural world. These places exist. I was thinking of a story tonight from many years ago when I used to speak in a church in, um, in, uh, in Arkansas, in Little Rock, Arkansas. One of the families in the church, the little girl had been abducted in the night. The window had been left open to a bedroom. The little girl had been abducted. And uh, for two days they searched for the little girl. Somebody had abducted her and taken her into the forest. Um, But two days later the little girl, wet and disheveled, walked out of the forest. And the police found her unharmed and returned her to her mother. And when they said to the little girl what happened, she said, I was taken into the forest, but my grandma came. And my grandma sorted it all out, and then my grandma walked me back here and left me here before she went back into the forest. The issue is, her grandma had been dead for years. But somehow that little girl's life was saved because there was a thin place between this world and the next, between earth and heaven. And when you understand these things, you get an idea of what Jesus was meaning when he said, I want you to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth like it is in heaven. You have a certain place, and in that certain place, heaven is very close. And in that understanding of heaven, the Father reaches out to you, just like he reached out to Jacob, and it revolutionized his life. Jacob had found a sacred space where he was aware of another reality within and around his current existence. Um, As Christianity expanded, of course, people have tried to find ways to, like with any product, how do we bottle this? And uh, one of the ways we sought to bottle it was by building churches, which in essence, was no different to the pagan concept because they built temples to their gods. And so we kind of, uh, and of course, even from the biblical model of temples and synagogues, we began to build meeting places. Um, Because one of the problems was um, that then the belief was that that's, you know, you met God in in a building. Now, I'm going to take this two ways. First of all, that is not necessarily the case. But secondly, I'd also say that that can be the case, and it ought to be the case. I believe, uh, not that God is looking to destroy the world, but God is looking to redeem and restore the world. I believe that the work of God by the Spirit is to put all things in order. And uh, we have the privilege of having a space on this planet, this space that is ours. It's a reclaimed space. It doesn't belong to the government. It doesn't belong to anybody else. It belongs to us. And this is a space that we should be using as a sacred place, a sacred space, where all our intention is, because we have this space and it belongs to us and we are here, we want this to be a sacred space where when people are here, they see angels ascending and descending and they hear God speak to them saying, do you know what, I've had you on my heart and mind and I've got your life in my hands. If you'll just listen and do what I say, everything is going to change. So I am not anti-church buildings. I actually think church buildings are a little claiming of space. But there's something even more important. In in, in the book of 1 Corinthians in the New Testament, in chapter 16, verse 19, there's a context of this which I can't talk about tonight, but Paul says these words which are very powerful. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have received from God? So may I propose to you that your body is a sacred space. That within you, within your heart, within your being, you are, you are this close, this close 
to an encounter with the creator of the universe. This close to the breaking in of miracle and understanding and restoration on your journey. This close to not finishing your life stuck in Haran, the between place, between where you were and where you ought to be. This close because you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. God has chosen to allow every one of us to be that certain place that we need to get a hold of and reclaim as sacred space because stuff happens when we do that. Now, we'll move on to a little bit of revision from two weeks ago and then to add some other thoughts in to try and help you in the practical application of this sacred space. Okay, we said two weeks ago that there are three notable observations regarding the early church which are very significant in how the expression of Christian doctrine has developed away from them. The first one was the absence in the earliest creeds of the church of any mention of conscious eternal torment being the punishment for non-believers. So, something of an element that you and I have grown up with inside the church and outside the church was not even mentioned in any of the early creeds because it was not what they were about. That was not the core of the gospel that God has judged humanity and humanity will be condemned. The other notable observation is the preeminent image of God as the true father and not judge. So their view was not God is the judge of the world. Their view is God is the father And we need to have a connection with him because he is the father. It changes the ground rules of how he will perceive us. Now again, for some of you that had an awful father, remember what we said. God didn't say to Jacob, your dad's your dad. He said, you've got another dad beyond your dad. And in that dad beyond your dad, there is in that father all the promises of heaven. So you have not and do not need to miss out just because you had a bad childhood or an abusive parent. In fact, you have something beyond that that can bring them bring the blessing you, you should have always been entitled to. One of the dominant truths of the first century church was something called adoptionism or inheritance theology. The reason that was very prominent was because what you get from a father is one of two possible things. You can be adopted by a father, and that was a big thing, that no matter how far we've gone, God has adopted us into his family. We're his kids. Um, One of the crazy quirks of law is that you can disown your father if you are a natural-born child, but you can't disown them if you're adopted. And an adopted parent can't disown you. It It is done It is for life forever, ad infinitum. So the Bible talks about our adoption as sons because it's a very powerful level of relationship. And of course, the inheritance thing was that what you're supposed to get from your dad is an inheritance. So they believed that God had become our father. Jesus had brought that to us, released it in our lives. And therefore, we now live in the inheritance of sons of the father adopted into his full family as part of all that he was. So in the Alexandrian church way back in the beginning, um, this issue of father was the big deal. They believed this one revelation unlocked all mysteries, solved all problems, explained all enigmas of time and eternity. And uh, the problem is when that form of Christianity became diluted by other forms, the fatherhood of God in its fullest and purest form became a lost truth And most of the worst errors of the modern creeds are due to that single fact more than any other causes. The third notable observation was that the resurrection, not the crucifixion, was the central theme. Let me read you this. For the first thousand years of its existence, the Christian church placed much more emphasis on the resurrection than the crucifixion. It was a religion of joy and not of gloom, of life and not of death, of tenderness, not of severity. For the first three centuries, the Christians were known for their joy. The symbols of the catacombs, which were the underground burial places of the Christians in those first three centuries, like every other indication of early teaching, showed the glad, bright, loving character of the Christian faith. We find in the catacombs neither the cross of the fifth and sixth centuries, 
nor the crucifixes of the 12th, nor the tortures and martyrdoms of the 17th, nor the skeletons of the 15th, not the death heads of the 18th. Instead of these symbols, we have symbols of beauty and hope and peace. The truth is, we, there is no picture of the crucifixion, I mean painted artistic picture, until the 9th century. And no portable crucifix till long after that. The point being that the resurrection, not the crucifixion, was the central theme. Crucifixion was a common event. Resurrection was not. Crucifixion did not define to the masses that Jesus was different. Now, stuff happened in Jesus' crucifixion that's very important and very powerful, but that was not what was impressive to the world then. What was impressive is nobody comes back from the dead, but he did. And that began to formulate what we can expect when we reclaim a sacred space. Because this is the power within the sacred space. So at the core of their message was the resurrection, life now, the power of life dominant over death, all their enemies becoming their footstool, God's kingdom showing up here and now changing the way things are. In the resurrection, Jesus grabs the world of matter and transforms it. It brings to us God's healing, transforming presence as a reality in the physical matter of real life. Because Jesus coming in human form grabs the matter of human form and in his resurrection brings another dimension of life which I would say to you is what happens when you are able to reclaim that sacred space. A guy I like to read, um, Franciscan Father Richard Rohr says, If God is Trinity and Jesus is the face of God, then it is a benevolent universe. God is not someone to be afraid of, but is the ground of all being and is on our side. In much of the Christian doctrine, you would believe that the Bible begins with Genesis chapter 3, which is where Adam and Eve fail, which is something that Christians call the fall, which is something that later on in the, in the Reformation, uh, uh, John Calvin, who had a major influence on Christian doctrine, called us all in total depravity. Total depravity, really? And we have from that something that if you've been around the church any length of time, and even if you've not, because I've heard Eddie Izzard joke about it, it's the doctrine of original sin, okay? Church obsessed with original sin. We're all sinners because of that. But you see, the Bible doesn't start in Genesis chapter 3, it's not rocket science, it starts in Genesis chapter 1. And in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we have the doctrine of original blessing. God made it and said, that's good. And when he finished it, he said, that's very good. And when he talks to his people, he's created, he says he blessed them, right? He blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, increase in number, fill the earth, subdue, rule over it. You see, the, the issue is original blessing, not original sin. Now the problem is, if you get that the wrong way around, one becomes all about how do we fix this? The other becomes about how do we restore this? And so one aspect of the gospel is all about trying to fix the problem of sin. The other one is all about trying to restore the blessing of heaven that has come that Jacob discovered this day when he was having to leave his little journey that he had been on and he found a place that was a sacred space and he encountered God and suddenly into that place was coming a restoration of what God always had planned. So let me read you something that dear old Brennan Manning wrote. Against all the canons of prejudice and discretion, sorry, against all the canons of prudence and discretion, Jesus announced the dawn of a new era, the inbreak of a higher righteousness, the mind-bending manifesto that he had come to call sinners, not the righteous, to repentance. More alarming still, he claimed that the sinner would be accepted prior to any statement of sorrow. First comes grace, given tenderness, then comes the decision to strike out in a new direction. The fierce mercy of Jesus is at work, protecting moral failures like you and me 
from the fierce, shaming, and moral debasement of religious bureaucrats who have severed spirituality from religion, the heart from the head, and grace from nature. Real sinners deserving real punishment are gratuitously pardoned. They need only accept tenderness already present. Forgiveness has been granted. They need only the wisdom to accept it and repent. These are the ragamuffins, the poor in spirit, whom Jesus declared blessed. They know how to accept a gift. Come all of you who are wiped out, confused, bewildered, lost, beat up, scarred, scared, threatened and depressed, and I'll enlighten your mind with wisdom and fill your heart with the tenderness that I have received from my Father. This is unconditional pardon. All of us need only to live confidently in the wisdom of tenderness. That little bit of wisdom around that, that I have discovered. It's much harder to gather a group around positive motivation than hatred, exclusivity, and division. So as a Christian leader, to some degree, I have, I have launched out on a leave the shores behind journey that is not equipped with most of the elements that allow you to gather a group around you because it's not full of hatred, exclusivity, and division, and condemnation. The greatest uniter of people, and this is a sociological and psychological fact, is over what they are against and not what they are for. So there is a principle in life that says if we can find a common enemy, we will be united. Well, guess what? We're not living that way here. We're going against the trend because we want to gather you around a positive motivation where you get back that, that, that sacred space. Listen to this. This is going to help some of you. Listen very carefully. Neuroscience has recently uncovered more evidence that negative experiences are like Velcro while positive experiences are like Teflon. Now, you know what Velcro is, don't you? Right? How many of you know what Teflon is? Teflon is the material that you have on your non-stick pans. So things don't stick to Teflon, but Velcro... So they've uncovered more evidence that negative experiences are like Velcro, while positive experiences are like Teflon. In research, they discovered that a positive experience must be savoured for a minimum of 15 minutes, or it doesn't imprint itself on the brain. Whereas anything negative, fearful, or hateful, the mind attaches to like Velcro. So what forms the greater part of your memories? How many of you know how easy it is to lose that moment that was so wonderful at the time, but now you, you, you can't get yourself to go back there. You can't get your mind. and It happened, but you can't. But how many of you can go back to the very second and the very moment on the very day to the very feelings of the very experience that was negative in your life and you've never forgotten it, even if it lasted for five seconds or five minutes or five hours, you've never forgotten it. It's still in your life today. It stuck to you like Velcro. That's just a fact. That's recent, that's recent proven scientific formula. And yet almost 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. And he said this, Finally, brothers, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Why? Because Paul knew 2,000 years ago 
that positive experiences are like Teflon, but negative experiences are like Velcro, even though Teflon and Velcro were not existing then, he knew that this was the case. And he said, if you want to change this, you have to restore and find and recover and reclaim that sacred place, because in that sacred space, you will find that what begins to attach to your spirit is the goodness of God. What you find is not you're in original sin, you find you're in original blessing. What you'll find, it's not the legacy of your natural father that's dictating your life, but the legacy of your father beyond your natural father, your heavenly father, so that your life now is touched where he can say like with Jacob, I'll give you this space. I'll give you it. That space that's been the space of pain, that space that's been the space of other enemies and things that taunted you and bothered you and rejected you and hurt you. He said, I'll give you that space. That's called reclaiming the sacred space. And I want you to reclaim that sacred space tonight. Where does it start? It first starts by me understanding that all your negative experiences of judgments and condemnations and hate and fear are stuck to you like Velcro. But by saying to you that this is a sacred space right now, and if you will enter this sacred space, there's going to be an ascending and descending of angels bringing back into this natural space the life that came in the resurrection that says, in the place of matter, our matter... And where we have the phrase that says things matter, in the place where it matters is where resurrection begins to show up. Jacob's life transformed because he reclaimed the sacred space. You can reclaim the sacred space of your life. God is not a thousand miles away. Hope and health and peace and joy and restoration and forgiveness are not somewhere way out there, they're here. They're that close. And so Paul's wisdom was this, okay? Start to think about that. But he says you need to give it at least 15 minutes. Think on these things. Meditate on these things. Doesn't mean, oh yeah, I hear you, thank you, I'll get a coffee and I'm off home. Meditate on these things means start to think about this stuff and say, do you know what? I'm, I am really, I, I am a product of original blessing. I am a product of a father who loves me. I am a product of a destiny that can be mine because this land can be given to me. I am that. You begin to think on that. I will guarantee you, even outside of what I believe spiritually, just the fact that neuroscientists are saying, if you will do that, something in- inevitably will change in the process of your life. Now what Paul's doing is saying, don't let that be just floating out here and there. I want to direct that to the Father. I want to direct that to the source of all life, to the core of all being, to the one who raised Jesus from the dead, because he who raised Jesus from the dead will also quicken your body, raise you, And lift you up in the same way. So here's what I would say to you in closing tonight. Savor joy. We give so much space to pain. And disappointment. And hurt. It's time to savor the joy. Here's what the Bible says. It says, tears may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You savor the joy that's coming. Remember when Jacob put his head in this uncomfortable place and in his discomfort, it was when the sun was going down. What I want you to know is the sun came up again. It didn't stop there. The sun came up again. And when the sun came up, it was a new day with new mercies and new kindness. I want to tell you tonight that you can come into a new day in your life. There's a new day, a new sun arising in your life, in your day. And the Bible says something else about that. It says in that day, it calls him, Jesus, the son of righteousness. It says he will arise with healing in his wings. In that new day, there is healing for every pain, hurt, obsession, abuse, issue that ever troubled you. There is a healing. There's a healing in it because it's life from the dead. You coming back from the dead. 
you coming back to life. But it starts with savor joy. Savor the joy that this is your promise and you can reclaim the sacred place. Reclaim the sacred space. Live in the wisdom of tenderness. Not in the condemnation of guilt and judgment. Live in the wisdom of tenderness. Find in your discomfort that this is the house of God. That this is the gateway to heaven. You say, what this? Yeah, this. What this? Yeah, this. It's the certain place. And every place for you can be your certain place. For some of you, that certain place is, is, is the thing you still feel from the stuff you experienced so many years ago. It's the certain place that I guarantee you the doorway to heaven is right in that certain place. And it will show up when you in your discomfort allow the revelation of this joyful position which is yours as the Son of the Father and as one who has been touched and called by what he has done, not by what you have done, in that place, angels are already beginning to ascend and descend, to ascend and descend. Because your answer starts here on earth. But it comes from heaven. Jesus came to be one of us to show us our answer was going to start here on earth but it would come from heaven. And that the resurrection life was not the same as the ascension. Jesus ascended to heaven, but when he rose from the dead, he rose into this world, into this life. The resurrection and the ascension are two different things. I believe there will be an ascension. There will be a resurrection from the dead that is an ascension. But I believe the resurrection of Jesus was about rising into this life, into where it matters, into matter, so that that incredible power brings deliverance and release. I want you tonight to reclaim the sacred space. Let's just pray just for a minute. Father, in this place tonight, with so many stories and so many experiences and so many feelings and so many wounds and so much Velcro, that sometimes we feel that our life is just one big piece of Velcro. And that all these pains and experiences have just stuck to us and stuck to us and stuck to us. But I thank you that your sacred place is a place where we start to get coated with Teflon. To where that stuff doesn't stick to us anymore. And it can't stick to us. We've become non-stick humans. Because the focus of our heart has been changed. Because we found a sacred place. And we found that beyond all the pain and the wounds and the abuse and the misuse. That we have been valued. And, and, and we have been blessed. And that we have been called. And that there is one, the Father God, waiting for us right where we are. And that this very place is our sacred place. And in that place, resurrection flows. Instead of living in the darkness of death and in the tomb... We live in the full brightness of your light and new experience launching us out into a new journey and where our experience is your tenderness, your incredible tenderness to us. And to live in the wisdom of that tenderness. Father, touch every heart tonight, I pray. I pray this wonderful experience will be the experience of each one of us, that, that we will set our hearts to come to that place and, and we'll save a joy and we'll save an answer and we'll save a blessing and in that we'll think about that for more than five minutes. We actually give our life to understanding and thinking on that and knowing that and in that place realizing that as the wounds of life and the and the hurts and the issues that we've had melt away, that in the place of that comes your presence, your goodness. The wonderful knowledge of, of, of us being at one with you. So I pray everyone tonight, Father, will receive that and accept it and move in that spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, there you go. So I'd like to say just two more things. One is everything I've told you is true. 
seriously. I, I don't mean that facetiously. I'm not trying to be funny. It is. I, I really, 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 really want you to find and, and reclaim that sacred space. And the other one is I'd appreciate your prayers because I leave for Australia on Tuesday. Um, so be a blessing to each other. I'll be gone a couple of weekends uh, out there doing our thing and taking what it is that we've learnt representing you. So be blessed and be here and be praying for us and we'll be thinking of you. And uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. All right, we're done. Bless you. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. Then why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.